Como parte das atividades do 70º aniversário das Nações Unidas, comemorado em todo o mundo durante 2015, o Centro de Informação das Nações Unidas para o Brasil, o NIC-Rio, e o Instituto de Relações Internacionais da PUC-Rio promoveram uma palestra com Stephen Schlesinger sobre o papel dos Estados Unidos e da União Soviética na fundação da ONU. Nós agradecemos a todos por estar aqui hoje para essa discussão. Eu entendo que o Jean Carlos vai introduzir The, the, the theme, and then we'll hear uh, Professor Schlesinger's uh, lecture. Well, good afternoon to everybody. I will be very, very, very brief, but uh, I would like to tell you that I'm very pleased to be here at, uh, at this very uh, fine university, this uh, uh, very important department in international relations. Here at the Cook University, a partner who has been a part of the United Nations in Brazil for a long time. Uh, this year, um, well, as you all know, this is a matter of the program, we are celebrating 70 years of the foundation of the United Nations. Uh, this is, of course, I mean, uh, we at the UN are specialists in using all the possible uh, round uh, uh, dates, I mean, so 56 or 70. To uh, not just to celebrate, but to reflect about the past as a way also to help us to define what the uh, future lies ahead. Of course, the, the world uh, 70 years ago was very different from now. Uh, there were uh, two billion and now applicants, now we are over uh, seven billion uh, on the earth. Uh, the, the UN was uh, founded by 51 countries. Today, the member states of the UN are 193. So, uh, and in the middle, a lot of uh, things uh, happened, of course. And, but now, uh, we uh, not just celebrate the 70 years that we, uh, we have behind us, but we want to reflect about the future. This is what uh, this seminar for today is, uh, is a was about, and with a very interesting discussion that took place, uh, took place here. Professor Schlesinger is the author of a book that I love, personally I love very much, Act of Creation, uh, the, found, the founding of the United Nations. Uh, at the UN, we do not have, when we enter the career, we don't have, we don't have a, you know, an exam like, for example, the foreign, uh, Itamaraty, the book of the first, uh, fair, uh, first service. Uh, we don't have an exam, uh, exam to demonstrate that we master everything. But there are other criteria, quite selective, but there is no bibliography that is uh, uh, mandatory to, to read before joining the UN organization. But then you start, uh, I mean, inquiring and discussing with colleagues what books are important to be read to, about the UN to understand where we are, where we work. And uh, I can tell you that uh, this book is one of the, our favorites. We, is, uh, we, I mean, we, it's, uh, it's not a secret, of course, but we uh, actually uh, tell uh, about this book to all new staff. And uh, we, is, uh, you know, recently we had a discussion about, among directors for, about the charter, for the preamble of the charter, of course, the reference about this. And this was the book of Professor Schlesinger. So I'm very pleased to be to, that you accepted this uh, uh, very kind uh, invitation that uh, the Book University uh, did to you. And uh, so, actually, I'm very glad you, uh, you're here, and I'm sure that your conference uh, will be, and your lecture will be very useful to uh, us all. The title that you choose, I mean, how the United Nations and the, the Soviet Union founded the UN. This is, uh, it was true in the past. Now, as the Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, said yesterday, uh, we are living again in kind of Cold War climate, which is very unfortunate. Also, all the, we were discussing this yesterday, I mean, all the, uh, also all, other old issues or themes like uh, nuclear proliferations, now again, they start uh, being around. I mean, we just, we thought that somehow we had to bury them and that the new spirit, that something new was happening, 
and uh, maybe uh, the, the, new, uh, the new times, the current times are not that different in some ways from the, from the original times. I mean, the, the, the equilibrium of powers that uh, led to the creation of the United Nations. So, uh, this is one more reason to, co to consider that uh, what happened 70 years ago, in these days, in San Francisco, now the San Francisco conference started on the 26th of April, 1945, so exactly 70 years ago, what happened then has a, a real uh, true impact today. So, uh, Professor Schlesinger, we are very happy to be to have you here, and we are glad to, I mean, to hear your lecture now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I thank you for the kind remarks of Professor Hertz and, and, and uh, Gina, Gina Caraya Suma? Giancarlo. Giancarlo Suma, who uh, is uh, the co-sponsor of this event along with, with, with your university. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here back in Rio. I haven't been here in 40 years, so it's kind of exciting to be back in this wonderful city. Um, I'd like to speak to you today about how the UN was founded. But first of all, let me say just what a remarkable anniversary we are <laughs> celebrating in the UN's 70th birthday. Uh, the UN has lasted seven decades and is showing no signs of faltering as an organization. Now that's an extraordinary ac accomplishment. Remember that the first attempt at a world security body was the League of Nations, and the League lasted only 20 years. The UN, in its own special way, has shown a unique kind of resilience in its ability to adapt and deal with global crises. And this really is a tribute to the extraordinary people who founded the institution back in 1945. Now let me tell you a little about the founders. It may surprise you to learn that the creation of the United Nations was, in its starkest form, a deal struck between two World War II allies, the United States and the Soviet Union. You may recall that these two nations, by the end of that conflict, were the two most powerful countries on Earth. So, if there was going to be a UN, it, it, these two countries had to be involved. But in many ways, it, 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 we talked about two countries, one which was a reluctant involver and one which was an aggressive involver as far as the United, the United Nations is concerned. Because it really was a one-sided deal in many ways. Because it was Franklin Roosevelt, the President of the United States, who was pushing for the United Nations. And Joseph Stalin, who was then the dictator of the Soviet Union, remained the reluctant partner as regards this idea. Now, Roosevelt was an unusual leader in this respect. You must remember that in 1945, Roosevelt really did not have to care about establishing a global security body. The United States at that time was literally the strongest country on the planet, even more powerful than Russia. And by, uh, by the war's end, Roosevelt could have well decided, what do we need a global security organization for? We, the most powerful country on earth, could operate unilaterally. We could just create co what they call coalitions of the willing when a crisis were, arose. And not, to, not worry about having to go through some official body. But Roosevelt had learned a valuable lesson from two world wars, the First World War and the Second World War, that, you, that the US, like any other nation, could not defend itself alone. It needed friendly allies. And the only way these countries, these friendly nations, would be available to aid the United States or any other country in future crises was to create an international assembly where all member states would collectively agree to stop aggression wherever it happened on the planet. So there was a lesson that the two world wars had st struck in, in Roosevelt's mind, in the mind of many of the other delegates who came to San Francisco, San Francisco in 1945, 
a lesson that 30 million people had died in the First World War, 60 million had died in the Second World War. We could not afford a Third World War. There was no way this globe, this earth, could go through another disaster or catastrophe like it had gone through in those two incredible wars. But let me say it again, it was these two nations that, that made possible the United Nations. Without the Soviet Union and the United States, there might have been an organization, but it would have been a very small and weak one, and it would have meant that the Soviet Union and the United States would not have been involved. They had to be the crucial conveners, or there really would not have been the great uh, organization that, that has been 70 years old as of today. The story really begins back in, uh, with President Roosevelt. Roosevelt, as a young man, had served as the Assistant Secretary of Navy in the administration of President Woodrow Wilson during the First World War. Now, both Wilson and Roosevelt were Democrats. And the Democrats, if you look at the history of America, American foreign policy, have traditionally been the believers in multinational and multilateral relationships. The Republicans, in a somewhat cruder way, believe more in the kind of sheer nationalism. So it was it, almost inevitable that if any, if any party was going to adopt the idea of an international organization, it would be the Democrats rather than the Republicans. Of course, it was Wilson who first proposed the League of Nations back at the end of the First World War. And uh, Roosevelt, and I'm going to refer to Roosevelt from now on by his initials, FDR. Uh, sometimes, uh, anyway, I'll refer to him that way. Roosevelt was one of the most important people backing Wilson as he sought this idea for the League. Ro Wilson's idea was the League of Nations, again, bringing in all the countries of the world would collectively be able to prevent aggression and the outbreak of crises and, and conflicts and, and produce and, and, and uh, make possible peace forever around the globe. But as you may or may not know, the American, at least in the American society, the U.S. Senate eventually refused to ratify the League and the U.S. never joined the organization. This is a bitter defeat for Woodrow Wilson and a bitter defeat for Franklin Roosevelt. And it fatally, re, re, it fatally undermined the League. Uh, but Roosevelt, even, even in face of this defeat, never gave up on Wilson's dream. When he became President of the United States in 1932, and as many of you may know, he served for four terms, more than any American President has ever served before or since and he eventually died in 1945 in the midst of his fourth term. <coughs> Roosevelt constantly looked for opportunities as a new president to reestablish a similar type of world body, even while at the same time the, the United States had almost totally retreated into isolationism. With the defeat of the League of Nations, the American body politic could care less about foreign affairs. They didn't want to have anything to do with anything outside their own borders. They could care less, as I said, about the League of Nations, and they had no interest in, in uh, creating a new organization like the one that e ended up being the UN. Um, so this was the sentiment in the 1930s that Roosevelt faced as a, as, as a new president. Um, however, as I said, in the back of his mind, he always kept the notion, we have to have this international body if we're ever going to guarantee peace around the globe. And so, as the 1930s uh, per continued, and the threat of Euro a war in Europe suddenly loomed very large, Roosevelt secretly instructed the U U.S. State Department in 1939 to start working on a new charter for a new organization, much along the lines of the League of Nations. Uh, but he didn't tell anybody in, the, in America about it, in the United States, because he knew that the isolation 
isolationist spirit was so strong in America at that time that had he even mentioned that he was thinking about creating a UN of any sort, he would have been uh, in absolutely full of, he would have created conflict in the country and it might have created, it might, it might have killed the, the idea in the, in, in the end. Um, but he, he knew that, he knew that there had to be a UN. He just knew it in his, in his heart and his mind that if there was going to be a great war, a second world war, the inevitable issue would be how do you, how do you create a peace which is enduring? And his view was you cannot have a peace which is durable without a security body that is universal in, in nature and includes all the countries of the world together working for peace. Anyway, it was not really until the complete Nazi takeover of Europe and then the infamous attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 that FDR felt he could start acting on his premise with the support of the American people. By then he had given a famous speech called the Four Freedoms Address, in which he called for freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom of religion, and freedom from, fe for f from fear for the entire planet. What he was saying was, the U.S. can no longer pretend we're not part of the rest of the world. And, in, and the values that the American people upheld should be the, are, are the values of everybody around the globe. They're not just the values of one country. But in, in enhancing those values and making sure that they uh, had support, he had to look out for global partners. Um, and once, he once the American government, uh, once the U.S. plunged into the Second World War, Roosevelt looked to his two closest allies in the Second World War, Winston Churchill in Great Britain and uh, Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union to come to some agreement about a UN, a UN body. First he sought out, he sought out Churchill, and Churchill very reluctantly but eventually agreed to, okay, I'm ready, we'll, we'll participate with you in, in this uh, uh, world assembly. But he was not that crazy about the idea, he much preferred the British operating on their own. Stalin was even more reluctant, as I said earlier. He was very fearful that his own interests, his own national security interests, would not be fully protected in a, in a, in a United Nations body. Uh, and, and frankly, Roosevelt had a problem with, uh, uh, with uh, Stalin because Stalin came from a dictatorship. He did not come from a democracy. And the th notion was that, among other things, the United Nations was trying to promote these human values that Roosevelt talked about in his speech on, on, on the um, uh, fr freedom of, of four freedoms address that he had given earlier in the 1940s. But Roosevelt said to himself, you know, if, I'm gonna, if we're, we're going to put this thing together, we've got to have the Soviet Union in here. So I'm going to disregard the issue of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of, of uh, worship simply out of a kind of sense of real politique. Do you all know what real politique is? It's a sense of this realism about foreign policy as opposed to idealism. Uh, it's a feeling that you have to deal with things as they are as opposed to things as you might want them to be. And Roosevelt realized that what was more important at this point during the Second World War was security, security, security. That was the top issue rather than free speech, free elections, and free assembly. And therefore, he was willing to overlook what Stalin represented as a dictator and bring him in to this new organization. Nonetheless, he was fighting a a, a tough battle with, with Stalin because Stalin uh, resisted this notion along a little with Churchill of joining an organization. I mean Stalin figured, listen, I have allies 
today from the first, Second World War, I have the British and the Americans on my side. What do I care about the rest of the world? I'll just be happy with my three allies and we'll, we'll, run, the, we'll run the world. And, and he wanted to stick with an alliance of the British, the, the Americans, and, the, and, 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 him, and his own people. That was enough for him. That became the theme throughout his talks with Roosevelt about the UN. He was basically concerned with one thing, preserving Soviet power. And he felt he could best preserve that power with this relationship with the British and the Americans. And, and, and in the end, if you look back at the history of, of Stalin as regards the UN, the UN was not terribly consequential in the calculations that the Soviets had over, America, uh, over foreign policy. It just was a kind of side story. It didn't really matter to the way the Soviets conducted foreign policy. Nonetheless, well, this guy Roosevelt, he really interested in, I guess I ought to give some attention to it. I mean, it wasn't something he was going to outright dismiss. And Roosevelt pressed him with a series of rather strong and, and, and influential arguments. I mean, Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill informally agreed that they would, those three countries would be the policemen of the world. But, but Roosevelt wanted to take that step further. If you're going to be acting as the policemen of the world, you have to do it within a, a larger entity, like an uh, a, a, a organization of, of the sort that the UN represents. <coughs> And Roosevelt said, it can't just be the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain. It also has to be China, which, which was you know, the largest population on the globe at that time, and France. Now, France was a war-torn country which had suffered very badly during the Second World War, but had been a traditional major power. So. Uh, there was some feeling that France ought to be in, involved in order to kind of counterbalance any possibility that Germany would ever revise, revive again. Roosevelt had one other idea. There should, be one, there should be a sixth country on the Security Council. The sixth country was Brazil. And in fact, for a while, Roosevelt very much was trying to get his partners to agree to put Brazil on the Security Council as the sixth sponsor of the United Nations. But in the end, the feeling was that Brazil wasn't quite up to the task that hadn't really been a, a major participant in the Second World War and that it, it, it lacked the kind of features that were necessary for a, to be considered a, a, a major power. Uh, so Brazil was dropped eventually. Um, in any case, uh, Stalin, despite all his doubts about what Roosevelt was proposing, eventually kind of capitulated to him. Uh, I think, in my view, he capitulated not because, as I said, he cared that much about the UN, but he really did want, he did want not, he did not want to alienate the American president. And, because he had a special relationship with FDR, and, and the US, during the Second World War had given enormous amount of economic, military, and other kinds of aids to Russia, which enabled the Soviet Union to survive the, the battles of the Second World War. So, and Roosevelt, and, and Stalin was also thinking in the back of his mind that once the war ended, he would want to continue to get American economic aid after the, after, for social reconstruction in his own country. So for all those reasons, again, he toyed with this UN idea and said, all right, all right, I'll, I'll, we'll think about it. We'll, we'll, we'll try to work something out. Anyway, by 1942, the second, really, the second big year of the, of the, of the war, Roosevelt got together 26 countries to all to come to Washington to agree to join a formal wartime alliance against the Axis powers, that's Japan, Germany and Italy. And they called themselves for the first time the United Nations. This was an, an alliance they were talking about, they, not yet an organization. Then in October of 1943, Roosevelt 
got his Secretary of State to meet with with the foreign secretaries of Great Britain, China, and, Mos and, and, and uh, Russia in Moscow, and they all actually agreed formally to a declaration supporting uh, the formation of the United Nations. Finally, in Tehran, the following year, in 1943, well, later that year, in 43, Roosevelt actually sat down with Ro Stalin and Churchill and finally got them to Make the, make the deal, agree to, to go forward with this idea of the United Nations. And this eventually led to a summit meeting of all of the principal uh, specialists in the UN at, at a Washington place called Dunbarton Oaks, where all the f four sponsoring powers, France had not joined by the, that time, but it was China, the United States, the Soviet Union, and uh, France, uh, sorry, and uh, Great Britain, all sent very, their specialists on international organizations to a meeting in Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C., where they actually drafted a U.N. charter. Now, this charter was based on the one that the U.S. State Department had originally designed back in 1939 under the secret instructions of Franklin Roosevelt. The charter itself was itself based on the League of Nations uh, compact, so that there was a continuity in the way these uh, organizations had all been designed. There were a lot of uh, similarities between the League and the United Nations, and between the, the Roosevelt idea and the one that um, came out to be the final charter. Um, again, during the design period, Roosevelt took into account the very thing that most distressed Stalin, which was protecting his own national security interests. And by the way, in doing so, Roosevelt also took into account how to protect America, America's uh, national security interests. And, and in doing so, Roosevelt came up with the most controversial issue at the United Nations not only then, but it's the most controversial issue today at the United Nations, namely the veto. Because Roosevelt proposed at the Dunbar and Oaks meeting that five countries, the United States, Soviet Union, China, uh, Great Britain, and, and France, would all get the veto. That no other country would get in the United Nations. And they would, they would be permanent members of what they call, what we call today the UN Security Council. They would be there the whole time. You could never get them off the Security Council, and you could never take their veto away. And that veto was a very powerful veto. It could block any action at the United Nations. And that was true in 1945 when the UN was set up, and it's true today. If you look at the UN today, same, same deal. Those five countries have the power to block literally anything that goes on in that organization. Very controversial decision. And it was a very significant departure from the way the League of Nations had been set up. Because in the League of Nations, every country had the veto. But the drawback in the League was that if every country had the veto, then a single rogue nation could stop any action by the League. And in fact, that's what happened many times when the League was functioning. The other thing that Roosevelt made clear and, and alleviated the worries of Joseph Stalin was that any decision by the Security Council was binding on all the member nations of the United Nations. And that is true today, too. When the UN Security Council makes a decision, every nation that is a member of the United Nations has to obey that decision. That is the basis of the treaty that they signed when they joined the United Nations. Now, it doesn't mean that every country will, but that is the, that was, that is the rock bottom obligation that every, every country has when they join, join the UN. And that also is in contrast to what happened with the League of Nations, because under the League of Nations, you could crap pass all the resolu resolutions you wanted, but you didn't have to obey them. You know, you could do it on a voluntary basis, but it wasn't obligatory. So those 
that decision about the veto and about the fact that any decision by the Security Council was binding on every member nation, significant departure from the League, significant step forward in terms of the power that the, this new organization was about to get, but one that you can imagine distressed every other country that didn't have that veto or didn't necessarily want to obey everything the UN made its decision about. Now, why did Roosevelt decide to give the veto to these five nations? There was a rationale at the time for his re reasoning behind it. His basic argument was that these five powers alone, at least in 1945, possessed the equipment, the financing, and the troops to support any future UN enforcement action. And since their arsenals would be involved in the fighting, and the blood of their soldiers might be shed in the fighting, then these nations should have the right to make the decision about whether they wanted this UN mission to go forward or not. That was the kind of rationale that Roosevelt produced as a kind of explanation for why these five nations should get the veto. But privately, Roosevelt had another notion in mind, which is namely, if, he didn't, if the United States did not get the veto, they would, the U.S. Senate would do exactly what they had done to the League of Nations. They would have rejected it. The only way U.S. Roosevelt could, could guarantee that his own country would, would join this organization and, and sign the treaty was to give the veto to the U.S. and that would satisfy the beliefs in the U.S. Senate that, our national, that, the, that the U.S. national security interests were being protected. Uh, okay, now that's the setup. Where do the smaller states fit in? Well, at this point, Roosevelt, reflecting his more idealistic vision of the, of the uh, organization, came up with the idea of the General Assembly. Now, the UN General Assembly is different from the UN Security Council. First of all, it's every country in the world, all 193, whereas, uh, you know, the Security Council is only 15 members. Um, but second of all, every country in the, in the General Assembly, no matter their size, their population, their wealth, or their middle, middle, military prowess, gets a single vote. So it's a very equal body. Every country is treated equally. A small island nation is the same as, a, as China in terms of the voting uh, process in the General Assembly. Uh, and this gave the smaller nations at least a feeling that they were getting some role in this big organization that they might have not had a feeling about had the, 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 the GA not, never been created. Um, but the drawback on the General Assembly was that any time the General Assembly passes a resolution, it is not obligatory for, for member states to obey it. It's a voluntary... Uh, obligate, a voluntary decision by a, a, a state about whether they want to obey it or not. Um, so what's the point of a General Assembly resolution if, it not, if it's not binding on every other country on the planet? Well, there is something that the General Assembly has which is notable and it's been, I think, observed by many people through the years, which is it has a great moral role around the world. When the General Assembly passes a resolution, it has a moral impact around the globe. And people pay attention to it. As I said, it may not be binding, but they feel in some general way that this is an expression of the, of, of the world about an issue that should be addressed in a serious and, 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 and noble way. And therefore, that legitimacy that comes from the moral authority of the General Assembly is quite extraordinary uh, for, 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 the, for, the, for the UN. In any case, you have the Security Council and the General Assembly, the two main organs, of, at least of the UN pr pr proper. Uh, nonetheless, for all of Roosevelt's dealings with Stalin, he, st he still couldn't fully satisfy the, the, the Russian leader. 
for example, in the Security Council, Roosevelt, Stalin started raising new objections. He now insisted that the veto power be an absolute veto. Now, what does that mean? An absolute veto would mean that even if you brought a, the, to the attention of, of, of the Security Council a crisis that was ongoing so that you could discuss the crisis. You don't have to make any plans about you, what you're going to do about them. You're just going to discuss the fact that this crisis exists. An absolute veto would mean you could block even that, even any discussion of a, of a crisis. Whereas Roosevelt had always understood that the veto should be more limited, that you, you could not block discussion of a, of a crisis, but you could block any action based on that crisis by the UN. But now, now as I said, Stalin wanted to have this absolute veto. And uh, Roosevelt pointed out that if Stalin, if you go forward with that, you're going to so anger the smaller nations who depend on the Security Council on war and peace issues that they may just walk out of the whole organization. What do they need the UN for if, if they can't even get a discussion of a crisis? Then the other thing that um, uh, had come up as far as the General Assembly was concerned is Stalin apparently concerned that most of the countries in the General Assembly would be from the West and therefore wouldn't be very happy about a communist nation like, like Russia, said, listen, I'll, I'll accept the General Assembly, but I want 16 votes. 16 votes? Why should he get 16 votes? Because the Soviet Union, which was a kind of empire, had 16 different countries involved in that empire. And therefore, Stalin argued we should get all 16 votes, just the way you guys in the West get votes for all your smaller countries. And this became a major stumbling block as, as the time got closer to uh, coming to a the San Francisco Conference of 1945. What do you do about Stalin's demand for 16 votes? In addition, and this is, uh, uh, you know, one of these arguments that go on endlessly, he particularly wanted Poland to be a, uh, considered a, a voting power, at, uh, sorry, a, a voting state at the, at the UN because Poland was a traditional enemy of the, of the so of Soviet Union, but had been taken over by the Russians during the Second World War, and was a prototype of kind of communist government. But the Americans and the West said, "You cannot have Poland involved as one of your 16 nations because Poland has all sorts of exiles that want to come back to Warsaw and create a democratic government." So. Poland should be a coalition government, not a communist-dominated one. These were the issues that captivated the Stalin-Roosevelt relationship as we got closer to the actual UN meeting in San Francisco and had to be resolved. If they weren't resolved, there wasn't going to be a UN meeting. For the, for the next six months, Roosevelt and Stalin argued back and forth about these issues through letters and emissaries and meetings between their foreign ministers. Finally, they met at a famous conference at Yalta in, in, in February of 1945 to resolve these issues and try to get some understanding before the, the San Francisco meeting took place. Well, Roosevelt was able to convince Stalin to back off on some of them. Um, first of all, Stalin acceded to the idea that there should be a more limited veto rather than an absolute veto for the uh, upcoming conference as, as regards the, how the veto should be treated. Secondly of all, he dropped the idea of 16 votes. He said, I'll take three votes. And the three votes were Russia, Belarus, and the Ukraine. And uh, at that point, Roosevelt didn't want to argue with the guy anymore and said, sure, you, you can have your three votes. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work with that. And, uh, and he finally got Churchill and, and Stalin also to agree to two things. One, the city where the meeting would take place to, to draft the UN Charter. 
And in deference to the fact that this had been a Roosevelt idea, Stalin and Churchill agreed that it would be in an American city in San Francisco in spring of 1945. And that was the date. It was actually open on April 25th, uh, but it began on April 26th of 1945. And at that point, the, two co the three countries sent out invitations to some 44 other nations to come to San Francisco for the grand meeting and, and begin the, the de deliberations on a UN charter. Yet, we haven't, gotten, we haven't even gotten to the meeting yet, and Stalin came up with a new objection. He, uh, you know, he's, he was a dictator. He, he was used to pushing people around. He didn't like to be pushed around. And he, uh, he, he sent a message to Roosevelt just a few weeks before the San Francisco, San Francisco conference was about to open. And he said, I've decided I'm not going to send my foreign minister to the meeting. Roosevelt was furious. Wait, we, 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 we all agreed at y'all that we were going to have this meeting. You're not going to send your foreign minister? That's an insult to me. I mean, Roosevelt was furious, and he thought that what Stalin was doing was belittling the whole idea of the UN, as he had been doing all along anyway. Uh, and, and a crisis erupted about whether if, Rose, if Stalin was not going to take this meeting seriously, then what was the point of the meeting? Well, in one of those great odd, odd, uh, odd twists of history, just as this whole crisis came to a fruition, Franklin Roosevelt died 12 days before the conference began. And suddenly, there was a new American president named Harry Truman, about whom very few people knew very much. And Stalin suddenly got frightened and thought, well, we got a new American president, and I, you know, I have to maintain my good relationship with the US government. All right, I'll send Molotov. Uh, now, I'll try to you know, be chummy with this new guy who's, who's in the White House and see if I can work out things with him. <laughs> before the San Francisco conference. And in fact, Truman, as I said, was sort of an enigmatic figure. He was a man who had never gone to college. He'd been abroad once in his life. He actually fought in the First World War in Europe. Turned out, though, that much of people surprised because they didn't know how he, Truman was going to react. Would he go forward with the United Nations? I mean, was he even interested in the United Nations? And, and furthermore, how would he deal with the Soviet Union? I mean, what, what did he know about foreign policy? Well, it turns out that privately or secretly, Truman had been a great internationalist. He was a, a great supporter of the United Nations, a great supporter of internationalism, and had followed very closely all the things that had been going on in the US government during Roosevelt's years. Though Roosevelt himself had never really brought him in to any discussions about foreign policy. In any case, Molotov finally goes to Washington, and before the San Francisco conference, he sets up a meeting with Truman to kind of establish a new relationship between the Soviet Union and, and America. Well, uh, Truman and he do not hit it off. In fact, they take a cordial dislike to them, to each other, at their meeting. And uh, as a result, they, get into a, they literally get into an argument, a verbal fist fight, over whether Stalin is agreeing to abide by the provisions of the U Yalta Agreement on, on Poland and on, all, on the issue of the veto and all these issues that everybody thought had been settled. And so uh, Truman in his own, uh, you know, he'd been present for two, you know, two, two weeks and was a, still kind of nervous about what his role should be, upbraided and really tore into Molotov and said, you know, you guys, you want this UN to be a success, you've got to abide by everything that happened at Yalta. Well, Molotov was not happy and he ended up saying, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm representing here the Soviet's interests and 
we'll do what we have to do and we'll see what happens in San Francisco. And he stormed out of the White House. And from the day he arrived in San Francisco, he, he was in a deeply angry mood, which influenced everything that went on during that meeting in, in sense, in, during the whole issue of the dealings with the UN Charter in San Francisco. From day one, he started issuing a series of preemptive demands. For example, he, uh, he told uh, his partners, the other four sponsoring nations, that he would oppose that the United States be president of their group. Sponsoring nations had their own little group within the uh, United Nations uh, uh, meeting. Well, traditionally, the country that is hosting the meeting is the president of the meeting. But in this case, the US realized that if we got into a bitter argument with Molotov over who should be president, when they really want to just get this damn UN set up, that it wouldn't be worth it. So they gave in. They, Truman said, listen, we won't, we'll let everybody, every sponsor rotate being president of the meeting. And we'll leave it at that. And so they, they kind of a compromise with Molotov on that issue. But it started putting the, the whole nature of the, of the dealings at San Francisco in a very awkward kind of motif because all the time the, the Americans wanted to move forward on getting an agreement on the charter, you had Russia kind of saying, nah, 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 you know. <laughs> and so this was a very difficult kind of uh, ne negotiations that went on. Um, the other issue, Molotov's other issues were, um, in the, uh, let me just get to the, um, he wanted the immediate admission. Remember I mentioned that there were three nations that would represent the Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Well, the deal had, had we all had been that Belarus and, 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 uh, and uh, Ukraine would come in, would be voted into that conference. Uh, but he wanted, Molotov didn't even want to have a vote. He, he demanded they be admitted immediately as our, the other nations who had been invited there. Uh, but Truman's people said no, with the deal you all had been, they had to be voted in. Uh, so that became a controversy. And then he wanted Poland to be, in, uh, to be admitted immediately. But of course, as I told you, Poland was subject to controversy because the West wanted a coalition government, the Soviets wanted to keep it a communist government, and so there couldn't be an agreement on that. Um, <laughs> So all of this was swirling around. This meeting had only been going for three or four days, and all this stuff was coming up. And suddenly, out of the blue, the 20 nations from the Latin American bloc came up with their own demands. They'd stayed in the background, by the way. They'd been, they'd been working together, but very quietly. But now, they insisted that Argentina be admitted right away to the meeting. Well, this was an incredibly controversial issue because during the Second World War, Argentina had been a pro-Nazi nation. And therefore, many countries at the, at the meeting didn't want to have anything to do with Argentina, didn't feel it should be admitted because it not, had not been time, part of the wartime coalition against uh, the Axis powers. But, our, but the Latin countries made clear that as a fellow regional, as a part of the regional body, Argentina was a fellow Latin country and should be admitted. It's just the way all of their countries would be admitted. Um, now the Soviets took particular umbrage against Argentina because, because of its Nazi leanings. But they were um, up against a very defiant Latin community as as the U.S. realized. Um, and the U.S. knew that at, at this point, the Latin said basically, if we don't get Argentina admitted, we're going to vote as a bloc against the admission 
uh, Belarus and uh, Ukraine. So this, this became a kind of mathematical puzzle. You know, everybody had their own interests at wall, and Russia and the, and the US were the ones who were being particularly, uh, you know, conflicted about how they should react to all these different uh, maneuvers. Uh, because the US feared that if, that if Belarus and Ukraine were rejected, that would be the end of the UN. The Russians would walk out of the conference and go home and forget the whole thing. But on the, on, on the other hand, if the Latins were thwarted and didn't get Argentina admitted, they, may pack, they might have packed up and said, you know, forget it, we're not gonna join the UN. So this is a very kind of, it was, it was like a little like high school, you know, all these little factions. Everybody had to get their way and how do you deal with them and come to some kind of compromise? Well, the U.S., in its infinite wisdom, came up with, with a kind of precarious compromise, a last-minute deal. Washington said it would stick by the Soviet Union and support the entry of Belarus and the Ukraine, but simultaneously it would oppose Moscow on Poland's admission because of the Alta understandings. At the same time, it would work with the Latin coalition and support Argentina's entry into the conference knowing otherwise that the Latins would carry out their threats against Belarus and, U and Ukraine and possibly reject the UN itself. Now learning of this strategy, Molotov lambasted Washington for its stance on Argentina and its refusal to admit Poland. But the conference nonetheless, by a large mar margin, voted for the American position, leaving Molotov virtually isolated. Then the question was, what was gonna happen? Would Molotov leave the conference? Would the Russians reject the UN? Would this be the end of the whole deal? All of a sudden, Molotov backed down, which was quite surprising given his almost operatic anger over what had been going on. Now it's possible that the rebuff he had suffered from this vote, this almost unanimous vote against the Soviet position by UN members, had unsettled him enough to make him feel it was time for a retreat. Clearly, he was out of sync with the other delegates. And his boss, Joseph Stalin, may have also decided and told Molotov that the prestige of staying on as a permanent member of the UN with the veto power outweighed Molotov's failure to secure his demands at the meeting. And finally, as a worried leader, <coughs> Stalin himself may have figured that by remaining in the UN, whatever the consequences, his country could keep better tab on his foes and assure themselves, assure himself that the UN could not totally turn against Soviet interests. Finally, I think it's fair to say that Molotov and Stalin had turned a, a, the Argentinian issue into a cause celebre. And even though they'd lost on it, they'd won on it in, in in many quarters, because a lot of people who felt Argentina had been pro-Nazi were furious that Argentina had been admitted under this formula that the U.S. came up with into the meeting. So in that sense, the West was a bit on the defensive, and from the Soviet point of view, there was nothing further to be gained. All right, so we got through that turmoil. We got through that uh, part of the uh, U.N. meeting. With, with, with at least some sort of precarious settlement. Now Molotov came up with some new concerns. The question was whether the UN should allow regional, regional bodies to operate within its ambit. Uh, you know, regional bodies like the Organization of American States or NATO or the Warsaw Pact, or, would, these kinds of bodies did not really have a role in the original structure of the UN Charter. Well, the, once again, it was the Latin countries that pressed the issue most vigorously. They demanded that their own regional body, which was then called the Rio Pact, later turned, became the Organization of American States, be given instant recognition at the UN meeting in San Francisco. And frankly, if it didn't, Bye-bye San Francisco. I mean, they were that furious about 
their position of having regional representation at the, at, at the UN meeting. Um, well, the US was ambivalent about this because basically they believed that the United Nations should be a centralized body and regional, they didn't really put regional bodies within the ambit of, of the way they saw the organization be set up. Um, and the Soviets too were, were fairly ambivalent about the whole idea of regional organizations. But they got a little more uh, angry about the idea because they heard rumors that one of the reasons why the Latin countries wanted to have their own regional body represented at the UN is because they, this was a way of fending off communist infiltration in the Americas. Well, when the Soviets heard rumors of that, they were immediately offended. They thought their ideology was being called into question and this was an anti-communist kind of action by the, by the Latin countries. Again, these, you can sense these tensions on various levels that were going on at the meeting. Once again, the U.S. was placed in a new dilemma. Um, from, the onset, from the outset, the big five, the five regional, as far as the five sponsoring powers, had agreed to give the Security Council exclusive veto power over all treaties and regional organizations. With one exception, they had granted the Soviets early on an exemption from a council veto for their bilateral treaties made before and during the war. Now the Latins argued in their turn, if the Soviets got such a deal, then why shouldn't they get the same deal, the same exemption for their regional institution? And then frankly, they said if they did not get that recognition, that would be the end of their participation in the conference. Okay, a new crisis arises. Washington quickly understands that it's gonna have to accommodate its Latin allies or the, or the UN meeting's gonna go bust. But to do so, the US now has to go back to Molotov and convince him that it's in the Soviets' best interest to accept this development. As you may guess, persuading Molotov of this was especially difficult, particularly since he was very upset over the fact that Argentina was admitted over his protest and over the fact that Latin delegates were going around the conference saying the reason they wanted this regional organization uh, recognized was to prevent few, few, future meddling by the Russian communists in America, in the Americas. Anyway, the U.S. finally felt they had to approach Molotov. To their surprise, he was non-committal about the whole regional idea. He was just then leaving for Moscow, and his replacement was the Soviet Union to Washington, Andrei Gromyko. So it was now Gromyko who had to play the role of the Soviet representative in, in uh, San Francisco. And, and Gromyko could give no clear answer to the issue of whether he would favor regional organizations or, or, or oppose them. Well, with, with this sense of ambivalence of not sure which direction to go in, the U.S. finally decided it had to take a chance and do and act on its own. And so without consulting Moscow, it worked out a, a deal with all the other nations in San Francisco. They all came to an agreement to propose a, uh, a Article 51, which is part of the UN Charter, to allow for regional organizations. Article 51, if you look it up in the UN Charter, allows for the presence and existence of regional organizations in, within the UN organization itself. And what it says is that these regional bodies have the right, the individual and collective right of self-defense against armed attack, which means that even before the UN takes uh, possession of a crisis, it allows the regional organization first shot at handling it. And that is in fact one of the one of the ways the UN has operated ever since, ever, ever since Article 51 came into being. Now this amendment, which the US had proposed with its other partners at the conference, without consulting the Soviets, was sort of a challenge to the 
question of whether the Soviets would re agree to stay in, the, in this body despite the fact that he really didn't want to be part of a, uh, had not come to its own feelings about whether it should agree to this thing, but also had not been consulted itself about the regional arrangement. Um, but in the end, much to the astonishment of not only the Americas, but to other allies on the, on the Western side, the, the Soviet Union agreed to accept the notion of regional representation. Why had they suddenly backed off on this issue? In my view, both Molotov and Stalin suddenly saw a potential gain under this amendment for themselves, for, Russians, for Russian authority. They realized that they could use Article 51 for their own purposes. For within a few years, the Russians did use Article 51 to create its own pact, the so-called Warsaw Pact. Just as the Americans, in their turn, use Article 51 to create NATO, the, uh, the opposing pact in, in the European, uh, European community. What, what this showed, in a, in a funny way, was that Stalin was willing to be flexible at times in these UN debates, despite his seeming low opinion of the body. He could retreat when necessary, but at the same time exploit opportunities when they became available. Well, all right, so we went to, through two successive crises that were threatening the whole existence of the UN itself. Now, Moscow and Washington, together, were, were faced by a, a sudden rebellion by the smaller nations at the conference over the very issue that had been most paramount to Washington and Moscow, the veto power. In the last minutes of the conference, the smaller countries came together and insisted that the veto power either be restricted or dropped. They, they were, had been smoldering all this time in the weeks that they were at these meetings in San Francisco over the fact that these five powers got the veto and we the smaller countries got no veto at all. Uh, so in their rebellion, they, they, they tried to get enough support from the other countries to either, as I said, restrict or eliminate the veto altogether. But, the, but at this point, Russia and the United States came together and basically said this. If you want to get, if you take away the veto from us, we're splitting. We're going to leave this conference. We, don't, we will not stay in the UN without having the veto. And at this point, the smaller countries realized that they couldn't afford to have an organization like the United Nations without the two most powerful countries on Earth not being part of it. So they backed off. And they figured it's better to have a flawed, organi flawed organization with these five countries with having the veto, then to have no organization at all. So we'll accept the fact that these countries have the, the veto, we'll live with it, but we'll try to operate even despite that on our, on, on our, in ways that give us some sort of influence about how the UN uh, does its, uh, its work in the future. And that was, that was a crisis that is really very illuminating because ever since that back down by the smaller nations, the issue of the veto has never gone away in, in, in the United Nations. Every, practically every year, if you look at the UN debates, the veto issue always comes up as a matter of pride and principle about the smaller countries and the fact that they don't have it. And if you look at any of the reforms that have been tried out over the last seven decades in the UN, they all come back to the issue of their veto. Do you restrict it? Do you expand it? Do you eliminate it? Uh, so if you are our, our followers of the UN, that issue in 1945 is still the issue in 2015. In any case, um, there was one final matter that had to be addressed. Believe it or not, Stalin suddenly came back to demanding 
that there be an absolute veto as opposed to, as opposed to a limited veto. Representing Soviet interests, Gromyko went to the, uh, brought up in the meeting at, in San Francisco that the Soviets were now demanding the absolute veto once again. Well, this really troubled Truman because, as I said, he, he knew in the Yalta Agreement that Stalin had abided by the notion of a limited veto. And, and we were still talking again about the absolute veto. Um, so Truman basically responded to the Soviets by saying that he was not going to retreat from his understanding of, of the Yalta Agreement. He was for the limited veto. And if, 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 if there was not going to be a limited veto, then you know, there was not going to be a United Nations. So the UN, as far as Russia and the United States were concerned, hung in the balance at that point. Because either one or the other country had to, to cave in in order to resolve this issue. There, can't, there wasn't any halfway point that could be met in terms of, of how do you resolve it. But Truman came up with an interesting solution. He had just sent a former top Roosevelt aide, Harry Hopkins, to meet with Stalin in Moscow to reestablish ties with Stalin on a lot of other issues that had not been resolved, including the, the issue of Poland. So Truman said to Harry Hopkins, why don't you bring up with Stalin this issue of the, of the limited versus absolute veto and see if you can convince him that it's time to just back off and go back to the, the understandings at Yalta. Well, Hopkins, he, he happened to get Hopkins at a propitious time. Why? Because Stalin and Hopkins were suddenly getting together in a very friendly way. And the reason was that Hopkins, with Truman's blessing, had conceded to the Soviets the rights to occupy all of Eastern Europe, including Poland, for their security purposes after the end of the Second World War. Truman had permitted this arrangement for the simple reason that the U.S. was never going to go to war to oust Soviet troops from the region. So Truman was making a virtue out of necessity. So now Hopkins had the opening to mention to Stalin Truman's concern over the veto at the veto statement at the UN, stalemate at the UN. Well, Stuben, when he brought it up to Stalin, Stalin's reaction was one of surprise or at least find shock, as if he'd never heard about the issue before, which seems very unlikely. But in the wave of his hand, he casually dismissed the issue as an insignificant, insignificant matter and said he would accept Roosevelt's more limited veto position. And in doing so, Stalin, in his final last gesture, saved the United Nations from collapse. The puzzle was why, after days of tension at the San Francisco meeting, Stalin had so quickly surrendered on the issue of the absolute veto. Well, and the most likely explanation, as I review it in my own mind, was he had <coughs> triumphed over the issue of Eastern Europe. He'd gotten <coughs> sovereignty, basically, Russian possession of, the, of Eastern Europe <coughs> and the concession by the West that they would not go to fight they would not go to battle over those countries of Eastern Europe. So now he apparently believed he could retreat on the veto and give this concession to the United States. After all, from him, his point of view, the UN, as I said before, was not terribly important. In any case, he would still retain the veto on all future enforcement actions, therefore protecting Moscow's security interests. And May he, and in, in making this concession to Roosevelt, he would recapture the wartime friendship he had with Washington and therefore hopefully get renewed economic assistance from the United States in the post-war years. So the long dalliance between Moscow and Washington over the UN finally came to an end and to a successful outcome. Of course, there were a few other adjustments the countries had to make at the UN meeting, but they were all eventually settled peacefully. Still, the overall encounter had proven to be an arduous exercise. 
As I have demonstrated, any of several missteps could have led to a breakdown at the bargaining table. The, issue, the three key disputes over the admissions issue, over the regional roles, and over the veto all had at one point or another the makings of an international fiasco, a global meltdown. But what finally kept the two countries going, in my view, on the road to the United Nations was their like-minded desire to retain the bonds of their wartime alliance. And it is quite interesting to read the speeches of Gromyko and Truman on the final day of the conference. Both men talked emphatically about maintaining cooperation among the big five, particularly among the Russians and, and the Americans. Now, as we know, just a year later, the Cold War began and the wartime alliance did fall apart. But by then, the UN was an operating concern and neither country was about to repudiate it. And in any case, the UN was turning out to be improbably a useful place to communicate, to do diplomacy, to avoid confrontations, and to settle disputes, just as Franklin Roosevelt had originally hoped. So that is the tale of how the United States and the F Soviet Union finally came together to create the United Nations. And what do we have today? Today we still have an organization of immense flexibility. The UN Charter has proven to be an, uh, sufficiently elastic to allow for the development of new, many new ways of dealing with crises that were not even mentioned in the original document. For example, peacekeeping. Peacekeeping was never mentioned in the UN, original UN Charter. It's now so much a part of the way the UN operates. Still, for all of its expansiveness, the UN, UN remains stymied by the veto power and still frozen in a Security Council dominated by the five victors of 1945. What should we do about this today? How should we handle the rigid formulas, formulas of yesteryears? These are truly important questions, but frankly, they are matters for another lecture. In any case, I thank you very much for your attention. in such a, an interesting and amusing way as well. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, ask, can, can the students ask a few questions? Sure. So we have a, a bit of time, so perhaps uh, some of you would like to ask questions? I'll take those two. Um, well, Brazil, you know, is now part of the so-called BRIC group of nations who are um, the four nations who are really contenders for positions on the Security Council. Let's see, there's uh, India, uh, uh, Russia, uh, I'm sorry, India, Germany, uh, Japan, and, uh, and Brazil. Uh, and uh, in any case, Brazil is, is a uh, country that obviously wants very strongly to get on the Security Council, and they make a, make a point of saying that a lot in, in the, up, 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 up in New York at the United Nations meetings. Um, I once talked to Kofi Annan when he was then Secretary General specifically about Brazil. I said, why, 
you know, if, if, if the Security Council ever expanded between beyond the five countries that are already permanent members and have the veto power, Brazil would be a natural uh, uh, sec new member to, to take that place. But he, as he pointed out, the problem you have with, with any regional area is that who, who, who will accept Brazil in the Latin community? I mean, Argentina wants to be on. Mexico wants to be on. Venezuela wants to be on the Security Council. In other words, even in a regional area, nobody is happy choosing one country to represent their region. And so one of the problems that Brazil would have to get on the Security Council would have to resolve the issue of how does it become the country that represents the Latin area without getting uh, past the demands of Mexico and Argentina and Venezuela and, and other countries who think they ought to be on the Security Council. The second problem, of course, is um, the five countries who have the veto, any one of them can veto Brazil. So we'd have to get those five countries to accept a position for Brazil on the, on the, on the, on the Security Council as a permanent member. And so th those two different um, areas of, uh, well, let's, how, how do you put a, uh, obstacles that they have to, obstacle runs that they have to go through are quite uh, difficult to get by. And, and so I think Brazil will continue to be very much mentioned as a type, the type of power that should be a permanent member on the Security Council, but will, I think, have a very long wait before it actually happens because of these two other, these two obstacles I mentioned to you, the regional obstacles and the, and the question of the veto powers on the Security Council. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, Brazil is very influential still in, 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 in the, when, when, it, when Brazil has been on the Security Council as one of the rotating members, uh, which each rotating member gets a two-year appointment, it, uh, Brazil has always been a quite influential uh, country that participates in all the debates on the Council. And, uh, and otherwise, simply because it's a powerhouse in, in this uh, region, it, 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 that alone gives it a lot of influ influence in the, in the UN. Now, as to the question of what, what is happening in Syria and what, what is the UN doing or not doing about Syria, you know, the, the problem with the UN is that because it is a security body that represents the entire world, every crisis of any nature comes eventually to the UN to be solved. The problem with the UN is that it, it, it does not have the resources or the structure to resolve all crises. And in the case of Syria, the structure is that on the Security Council, as you know, five nations have the veto. And every time the West has come up with pr proposals to cr create a political settlement, uh, Russia vetoes those uh, proposals on the grounds that it is supporting the Syrian government. And, and therefore, the Syrian government, until it itself is willing to participate in, in some sort of settlement. Uh, as long as it's not, as long as it's resistant to that, the Russians are gonna make sure that no, nothing passes in the, in the UN Security Council, which would propel UN negotiators into a position where they could actually resolve the conflict and bring peace back to that country. Um, so structurally, the UN is impeded at this point from doing anything beyond that. On the other hand, the UN does have, under the auspices of the security uh, of the Secretary General, the right to appoint um, negotiators or pe people, uh, UN personnel who go out and represent UN interests in that conflict. Right now, uh, there is a person who is 
doing that, fulfilling that role for the UN. He's trying to bring the parties together, even though he's getting resistance from all sides. He's been, they, the UN has been doing this for all the years that, that it's so that the Syrian crisis has been going on, which is almost three or four years now. Uh, and so you have to give credit to the UN that they are trying to, they do put a, a emissary out there to try to bring the parties together to create the conditions for negotiations. They're not only doing that in Syria, they're doing it in Libya. They're doing it in um, uh, countries like uh, Lebanon. They have representatives in um, practically every country in the world at this point who, who, are, who are trying to do what the UN is supposed to be all about, bring about peace. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It worked, for example, in Guatemala. It worked in Angola. It worked in Mozambique. It worked in Cambodia and all those countries. A UN negotiator was sent out there to bring conflicts to an end, and they did. They've created the conditions for peace, and those countries are now today, uh, you know, fairly uh, peaceful societies. So my feeling is you never, the UN is an is a organization which will always be out there. It's going to have a lot of hits and misses, but it's also going to have some successes. And it's the only body that exists in this world that can do the kind of negotiating that can bring about peace. So we ought to support it for what it can do. And when it doesn't you know, succeed, we have to just maintain our belief that we, if we continue to hold to the virtues and ideals of this organization, eventually it will triumph. And I think that's the position that most people in, in the world hope, because I think that's one of the reasons why the UN remains such an admired body today. I'm also a So you're to, I'm not sure I got, you're talking about the war of, uh, against terrorism or war? Yeah, yeah specifically, yes. Yeah. And what? And what is the position of the UN ah. about that and what could be done? Yeah, the, the war against terrorism is a, been rattling the UN for years. And in fact, they, they have set up a, uh, they have actually a unit in the UN now which deals with terrorism. And one of the, initial problems with terrorism is that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And you, you know, you, how do you define terrorism? Uh, and this cr created a lot of splits within the UN community because, um, as I said, uh, some guerrilla trying to overthrow a bad government could be considered a terrorist, but from the point of view of the people who think that the government was bad and this guerrilla is, is actually operating and trying to bring about democracy, then the guerrilla is good. So how do you parse the question of who's a terrorist and who isn't? I think there, has, there is a general conclusion, though, that um, terrorism, at least in, in, the, in the nature of, of um, this kind of fundamentalist notion that you can blow away people because they, 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 they don't agree with your point of view. Uh, that kind of terrorism, whether it's religious or ideological, is, is where the, US, the UN does tend to focus on. And as a result, um, there have been a lot of resolutions passed in the UN Security Council against that kind of terrorism. Uh, when 9-11 when happened, when the US was attacked in, in September 2011, uh, 20, 2001, um, the Security Council unanimously voted to fight against that kind of terrorism, 
represented by the Al Qaeda group. Uh, and as a result, they put sanctions on the Al Qaeda group. They, you know, created a, a terrorist unit which monitored all the kinds of ways of restricting financial flows to the Al Qaeda group and um, promoted the notion of the NATO troops going into Afghanistan to defeat it. So there have been very proactive measures by the UN when it comes, to, comes down to that kind of fundamentalist um, mayhem. Uh, and, and that continues today. They've, they've, you know, now that you have the ISIS group in, in the Middle East, which is the, the UN is now collectively sought all sorts of sanctions against ISIS. Uh, so if, as, as, long as, you have as long as you have unanimity on the Security Council and you don't have any of those five permanent members blocking action by the Security Council, you're going to have action by the UN against terrorism. But once the issue becomes confused or at least complicated by the issue of what's a terrorist, is a terrorist a freedom fighter or not a or, 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 or a genuine terrorist. When that issue comes into play, you're not going to have unanimity on the Security Council. And, and in those cases, the UN may not be able to take any action. Okay, my, you're talking about that um, Roosevelt focused on security and security, but you're saying that the UN has been identified mainly with peace, right? That contradiction between the two. Yeah. Well, um, if you actually look at the UN charter, it's actually a very aggressive charter. It's actually almost militaristic because it, it, section uh, se um, seven of, of, the, of the UN Charter is all about how the UN can go into action using all sorts of military troops and, and planes and ships to stop aggression around the world. The UN was really set up to, to um, as a result of two world wars, to prevent the outbreak of a third world war. And, um, so a lot of the charter itself is full of bloodthirsty language about it. We're, we're going to stop this kind of aggression. And, and uh, it's odd because what, when we think about the UN today, we think about it as a peacemaking body, which it is. But it has all these instruments that are part of the charter which allow it to take um, military action collectively against what, they, what is seen as aggressors. And um, so in a way, what, when Roosevelt was talking about security, 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 he was saying, listen, the most important thing right now is to get to the point where we have no more war going on. We'll worry about all the issue of freedom of assembly, free speech, free whatever later on. But let's just get the war ended first and, and, and do that through the auspices of this collective group of United Nations countries. Um, and so if you look at the charter, though, it does proclaim a belief in human rights. It does proclaim a belief in all the freedom that we, we, we care about as, as, as people in, in, around the world. But um, it, it doesn't do it exclusively to the issue of the notion for enforcement actions that recreate, which require the UN to use military power. 
I don't see the necessarily a contradiction between the two. I, I mean, what you're doing basically is you're defeating bad people in order to create peace. And so that is, again, one, one, uh, the UN creates peace in a lot of different ways, negotiation, diplomacy, as well as military action. All of those are tools that the UN has at its disposal, but I don't see them as contradictory. For now this is your lecture and also after uh, reading uh, your book and well, a number of books about uh, mm -hmm. Roosevelt and uh, what the U.S. did uh, before and during the Second World War, uh, preparing the creation of the U.S. So well, this is really I me. Mean, I, usually, I used to say that uh, this is for me the very true definition of statesman. Somebody it was a kind of a, such a vision that the 39 decided that we have to, when the war was starting in Europe, we, we, we must build the organization that will stop the next war. So, yes, this is a kind of statesmanship, if uh, you this is like. Well, this is the, so let me take advantage of the fact that we are a university, not a, in a UN and, uh, office, so I, I would ask a, a question that is not so appropriate in my uh, official function, but I mean, what happened to, in the U.S.? I mean, this is the, uh, we actually uh, owe the, 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 the existence of the U.N. mainly, I mean, to this vision and effort uh, of President uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the, of course of its people, the State Department and so on, and uh, so, well, and so it's, it's, it was mainly, as you explained, it showed the U.S. creation. When, how and when, I mean, uh, there was this uh, uh, growing dissatisfaction in the, the U.S. against the, the U.N. I mean, when uh, the, the U.N. start uh, uh, beginning, not just, I mean, the, the, the poster child of the UN, U.S. vision, but kind of a problem or something that is not such uh, seen as such a useful thing or a useful instrument. What happened? Well, you know, that's a, that's a very important question because, um, you know, the United Nations, the reason why the United Nations is in New York City is because the countries at San Francisco decided that they were so fearful that the U.S. would withdraw into isolation, isolationism again, as it had up until 1945, that they figured if the U.N. was in New York, the U.S. couldn't exactly withdraw from, from the United Nations. It was a very big leap for the United States to join an international organization. You know, the U.S. is in a, in a unique geographical situation. It's separated from Europe by one, one huge ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and it, on one side, and separated from Asia by another huge ocean, the Pacific Ocean, on the other side. And it is used to bring, it has used, for many years, for decades, it went its own way. It, was, it didn't like to be, uh, you know, told what to do. It was, it was always acted unilaterally. And so there's a great, deal of strain in the American character, which is we, you know, this kind of nationalist strain, native, nativist strain, that is, we want to be able to act as we wish without being constrained by outside powers. So with, when Roosevelt and Wilson tried to embed the U.S., first of all in the League of Nations and then in the United Nations, it took an enormous amount of effort to do that because it went against the grain of, of American history. So even now, even though the U.S. is still in the United Nations, is still at least probably the most powerful country on earth, except you know China's getting up there, um, there is that part of the American character which is, resents having to be part of an international organization. And as a liberal internationalist like myself, I find myself fighting against these people all the time while I live in the United States. They're the people who, like George W. Bush, unilaterally sent troops into 
into uh, uh, Iraq, you know, without the permission of the United Nations. An outrageous act. It went totally against the UN Charter. Uh, but there is that strain that, that is not fully eradicated in the American community, and one which, it, one, as, a, as I said, as a liberal interna internationalist, you have to keep fighting against because it keeps popping up. So I think I would, I, if you're actually looking at the polling data in the, in the United States, by and large, 67 to 70% of the American people support the United Nations. Uh, they have no problem with it. They think it does a good job. But when you get a president who rallies against the United Nations over some particular issue, in this case, it was Bush over Iraq, then you can whip up this enthusiasm and, and anger that go, goes back to that nativist feeling in that country, and it will um, emerge as you know a kind of nationalist, we gotta be behind the president, and we gotta invade in Iraq, the hell with the United Nations. Um, and I think that, that, that is a danger not just in the United States, I think it's a danger in most countries. I think most countries have the, uh, that nativist feeling that they can go their own ways when they feel that they uh, have the right to do so. And I, I think it's one of, the, one, one of the biggest problems that faces the United Nations in the future is making sure that people abide by the standards created in the Charter uh, that the UN represents, and I, I'm hopeful that the, the uh, at least I know under the present government in, in Washington, under President Obama, who is a big supporter of the United Nations, that um, we won't have to face that situation again any anytime soon. And we can take one last question. I think he was going to. Good afternoon, my name is Eduardo. I am an international, international relations student of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And my question is, do you believe if it suffers a reform, the UN is, is capable or supposed to be a worldwide government in the future? I'm sorry, the first part of that, if I, the reform? Uh, if it suffers a reform. If, 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 if reform happened? Yeah. yeah. In, okay. In, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Uh, if you talk to some specialists on the UN, th th their feeling is that uh, we'll talk about the Security Council first and then the issue of world government. In the Security Council, you have 15 countries and five veto powers. So five of the 15 are permanent members. And there's a feeling among some UN specialists is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. In other words, the UN Security Council has operated pretty well through the years. Why do we have to turn, worry about expanding it or bringing in new members or, or diluting the veto or whatever? Um, and, and therefore, they think that uh, if, you, if you, for example, if you, enlarge the, if you enlarge the membership of the Security Council, it becomes more and more difficult to make decisions. Uh, or it makes, it slows down the whole process of, of the UN in its deliberations. Um, on the other hand, uh, clearly there are a lot of countries around the world who feel that the, when the UN Security Council makes a decision, it's losing its legitimacy because it has five countries with a veto who are victors of 1945 and may have been powerful then, but today, who is France, Great Britain? I mean, they're hardly powerful countries. Why should they have the veto today? In other words, the Security Council should represent the power realities of 2015, not of 1945, and therefore you should have reform, 
uh, that reflect that, those changes. So um, my own feeling is that eventually there are going to be changes on the security guns. They have to. I mean, the, 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 this, this condition of, of having everything frozen back by what happened in 1945 cannot continue. It has to be changed 70 years later. Uh, and I think eventually world opinion, I think opinion within the, among the majority of, of states in the UN itself, all this is going to force some sort of um, revisions. <coughs> As to the issue of world government, I don't, I mean, I think that, you know, the United Nations is an undemocratic body because people are, delegates are not elected to the, to the United Nations. It's simply a collection of different countries, uh, all 193 representing the constituency, the, 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 the uh, makeup of, of the uh, member nations. And those, some of those nations are dictatorships and some of them are democracies. Some of them are in between, whether they're quasi-democracies or quasi-dictatorships. So if you were, really were to talk about world government, you'd really have to think, start thinking through whether that would mean that all the countries would elect their delegates to, to a world government and whether that would be acceptable in, in terms of uh, how would you deal with the dictatorships that still exist, whether countries would be accepting of giving up their sovereignty to a much larger body that would start making the decisions that their own parliaments or legislatures are making. It's a very difficult road to see uh, ever uh, countries ever coming to, to agree on. Uh, there might be efforts to, um, in limited ways, to kind of have countries give over authority to certain divisions or, or agencies within the UN. But I, I don't, the world government thing is, is a real dilemma. I mean, in a sense, you could argue the UN is approaching in many ways a world government, but it's an unrepresentative one. And uh, I think to get to that step, I, I, I think it's very unlikely to happen in the next century. I just don't see it happening. It's gonna, it's too many unpredictable variables for it to happen. Too many countries would, would resist it. Too many issues would have to be resolved. And um, I think we have to be happy that we do have the UN today as, as the best we can get. Okay, Professor Schlesinger, thank you so much for uh, your talk and your answer to our, our students. It was a privilege to have you here, and I'm sure they'll remember this day. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. I appreciate it.